our big focus this hour, which is the uh, NewsX and Business World special panels on the Indian economy. We, uh, of course, as always, have a very special panel uh, joining us for this, uh, for this show, which, of course, decodes where the Indian economy is currently uh, and, of course, what the plans will be in the next six months or uh, eight months for its revival and hopefully for it to bounce back to the pre-COVID levels. Let me bring in uh, Varun Alag. Uh, co-founder and CEO, Mamaz, who's with us live. We also have uh, Aparupa Sur, founder and partner of the Crazy Yogi, uh, freshly roasted and brewed artisanal coffee with us. Uh, Vaibhav Kandilwal, co-founder and uh, CTO of Shadowfax is with us. Sushant Gupta, founder and CEO of SG Analytics is also joining us. Subhi Bhatia, founder and CEO of The Mom Store is with us live. Imanshu Johar, uh, director of Lloyd's Ventures joins us live. And uh, Dr. Tanurag Batra, editor and chief of Business World, is with us live as well. Um, welcome all of you and thank you for, for joining us. Let me bring in uh, Varun Alag first if I can at this point. Varun, uh, how big a hit has your sector taken uh, as a result of you know the, uh, the pandemic and of course the lockdown? And as an entrepreneur, how are you readapting uh, you know, to get your business in order uh, you know, despite the current situation? Hi there, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, I think overall, uh, entire economy as well as all sectors have been hit, uh, some less so and some more so. Uh, we are slightly fortunate to be in a sector of personal care, um, which, is, which is more essential than some of the other uh, sectors and hence has not seen as much of a decline. And although during the first four weeks of lockdown, when we also did see tremendous decline, uh, which was largely fueled by our ability to supply. And it was not like uh, consumers had stopped uh, using personal care products, but uh, um, largely because ability to fulfill did not exist, we saw uh, sliding uh, volumes. And uh, given our business is actually 90% plus focused on e-commerce and online-based fulfillment, and uh, after April, uh, May and June onwards, we've actually seen a positive revival. And uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm sort of happy to uh, say that we are actually at uh, uh, ahead and significantly ahead of our pre-COVID uh, volumes now. And uh, consumers have clearly shifted to one online-based uh, purchase, and, and secondly, have also shown more inclination towards brands which are chemical-free, natural, and safer compared to some of the other uh, brand propositions which exist out there. And so both of these levers have actually positively affected uh, our business. And, and we're, we're, we're growing uh, ahead of uh, our uh, quarter one volumes and significantly ahead so. And uh, if there's any change in the way you operate, what does that mean? Uh, I think if I was to say three things is specifically what we have uh, uh, done, right? and, and and these three months have taught us a lot. Right? And um, if you talk about overall the consumer products and FMCG sector for the last two decades, two big trends had happened. Right? One uh, to save on uh, bottom lines and profit margins, a lot of uh, uh, externalization and import imports of key materials had started happening from markets like China, etc. Um, which clearly has taken a backseat in, in uh, today's times. Right? And localization as a strategy is clearly uh, coming up. Right? So we are, we are really happy with the uh, vocal for local uh, war cry which has uh, come forward. And we had, uh, for the last six months, already been aligning ourselves towards more localized strategy. And that's what we have seen happening. And I think the second thing uh, that has clearly happened is... Uh, um, around around cre creating um, uh, you know more centers of supply and so from uh, operating on hub models where you had large warehouses and you were operating from them and uh, to having significantly larger number of spokes from which you can operate because there is clearly uncertainty around lockdowns which persists and is going to persist for the next few quarters right so we during this period have actually opened warehouses in uh, about five more cities and in the last two months itself right uh, because uh, multiple issues be it the 
um, Amphan cyclone in Calcutta or, um, you know, the, the lockdowns in Bombay and, uh, you know, the recent lockdown in Chennai led to closures of warehouses in different locations. So you had to have options from where you were able to supply uh, your customers. So I think that's the second big thing that has happened, uh, you know, in terms of why, the way we have changed. I think the third thing that we are doing consciously um, is realizing consumers are looking for hygiene propositions, right, and germ kill propositions. And we are figuring out more categories uh, where we can provide those propositions, right, because that consumer shift is clearly visible. Right? And they are specifically asking us uh, for the same. So I think those three are the big changes that we've made as an organization. Thank you, Varun. Aparupa, if like Varun has found a silver lining in the cloud, you've turned an entrepreneur in these times. You start, started a coffee brand. Uh, so. What made you do that and where do you see the demand for your product in the next three to six months? So uh, firstly, Anurag, thank you for having me on the show. I think uh, this is a great panel to be in. Um, so we started the coffee journey in January. Uh, obviously didn't have an idea of this pandemic coming our way. And when it hit us, I think we grappled for a couple of months initially, mostly like how Varun again mentioned, because of supplies and you know, deliveries and stuff like that. Uh, but soon, uh, I think we realized that the digital platform has caught on and people are, you know, vigorously moving towards this online platform and ordering stuff with a high quality, with your organic, um, especially for coffee, you know, when people started working out of home, you know, most of the corporates shifted to working out of home. People realized that they wanted the home, the coffee. New, the home, <laughs> the new schools, there are the new offices, there are the Absolutely. new cinemas. You know, Absolutely. Entirely new meaning. And when you're working out of home for 12 hours, you need ah. good coffee, right? And teaching them how to brew fresh coffee was much more easier than before because they had the time, they wanted good coffee. And, uh, you know, once they started ordering, then I don't think uh, they have gone back and they started subscribing. So the last one or two months has really seen a surge in our online orders and, you know, retail also. So uh, as far as coffee goes, and I think there are other product categories like biscuits yeah. and instant noodles, they have seen a huge... Uh, yes, you know, and, and you know, your, your, uh, your product, of course, is also artisanal coffee. Yeah. Um, and we've seen the growth, you know, in the last two, three months, particularly of, of homegrown, artisanal yes. and organic brands. Uh, because of, I think, two reasons, perhaps. One, this whole go vocal for local push. And also, two, uh, you know, people wanting to cut out uh, extra, you know, additives like uh, and wanting to go yes, for artisanal yes. and organic stuff. Is that correct? Is that a trend you've seen? Absolutely. And then you see people have started realizing that, you know, the instant stuff is not good. You know, they would actually want to have something which is grown organically, which has a traceability, which uh, they have, uh, which they know where it's coming from. You know, you would want to know where your coffee is coming from. And of course, the health benefits, you know, of fresh coffee vis-a-vis -vis an instant coffee. So people are slowly moving and I think uh, in a very um, uh, consolidated manner towards good brands which are offering, you know, organic stuff, which are offering chemical free stuff. And I think as, as a world, I think the next generation, the millennials are also very, very focused towards this. So I think there's a good opportunity for brands like ours who are focusing on health, clean products, chemical free products to, uh, you know, uh, have a good market share and um, you know with the government's boost i think the stimuli to uh, msmes and startups i think we'll have to see in start at some point how it trickles down to new brands like us but uh, the fact that this government is focusing on startups and seeing this as an opportunity of growing indigenous businesses i think is a very positive move okay, okay. Uh, let's take that to weber kandirwal if we can uh, weber uh, you know, what about your uh, business? I think your product offering is also pretty unique uh, in, in these current times. Uh, so how, how, you know, how have the last three months been like for you and your business, uh, you know, and, and what really led you uh, to create Shadow Facts and, and, you know, of course, apart from your other founders as well? Sure. Thank you. There. Uh, uh, so last two, three months have been really hectic for us. Uh, to just give a bit of uh, context here. So we are into the Express Logistics platform. So uh, we work with uh, the major consumer brands across food, grocery, pharmaceutical, e-commerce, FMCG. And uh, we do uh, their last mile or their network operations for them. So uh, uh, when the lockdown started, uh, 
there was a hue uh, there was a massive hue and cry for the essential items and uh, our orders in grocery and pharmaceuticals actually took a massive spike at that point of time and at the same point of time uh, we also had to invest in a lot of uh, capabilities which uh, resulted that uh, the deliveries that we are doing they are actually safe and the customers are not actually uh, getting an undue risk of uh, unhygienic uh, items being delivered to that so we had to build in a, a ai algorithm to detect whether our delivery fleet is wearing a mask or not whether they are carrying a sanitizer or not and at the same time we use a lot of location analytics to identify that uh, which of our delivery partners are coming in from uh, uh, the containment zones and which of them are having a higher likelihood of getting a risk of infection so these have been really hectic zone for us but the good silver lining for us is that the move in this segment is clearly towards home delivery uh, almost all the big chains in india almost all the big players in india they are now focusing on the importance of home delivery and that has actually increased a lot of our margins that has also increased a lot of our revenues at this point of time so that's uh, that has been uh, the overall journey here uh, uh, some uh, traditional players like dmart for example they uh, they also were very quick to pounce on uh, the growing demand from their retail outlets as well but so, there's, you know, there's uh, a yeah, perception has been where, uh, there's a perception and uh, this is a larger question of course you spoke uh, you know at a micro level uh, just now but on a, on a larger level you know there is a perception that uh, you know for startups funding is drying up currently uh, you know there have been examples though of, of startups which are still getting funded in the last three months but the general perception is that vcs and you know other entities are not funding as much as they were and, they, and their revenues have gone down to yeah. unprecedented low levels so there is a yeah. twin negative impact to low revenues right. and lack of continued funding and that may lead to right. startups shutting down so what do they is asking you do you see that uh, startups around you are facing issues and do you see funding as a big issue going forward or or is it an unfair perception to say this what we just said uh so i would uh, align with the thoughts that uh, you guys shared on it funding has been uh, uh, a concern for some of our uh, 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 clients or some of the startups whom we work with a uh, couple of reasons on that end i mean uh, uh, the market was bullish prior to covid and all of a sudden covid hit us so capability or the shock that actually the vc is token that was significant and if you also see the sectors where they used to invest in the shared uh, economy was a major theme of investments that actually took a massive toll toll uh, during this covid period you now would want to own the asset rather than use a shared uh, home or a shared bike or some other shared uh, economy tool there so that has taken a hit the second part that has also uh, impacted the startup funding is the entire uh, uh, the arrangement with china so chinese startups with the likes of alibaba tencent uh, and a lot of other players as well they used to invest extensively in some of our growth stage startups so you talk about ptm you talk about swiggy zomato they were big beneficiaries of uh, that fdi coming in from there with the updated regulations coming in on that end the funding has actually dried up here uh to be honest uh, i would say the uh, the impact on these startups the startups as you uh, would also align the entrepreneurs they have a fighting instinct there is a reason why they have grown to that much stature and that's why uh, you would see a lot of them still uh, hanging in around still innovating to find their right balance out there but uh, if you ask me on a macro level perspective uh, certainly a large number of startups they have pivoted or they have shut shop uh, shut their shops at this point okay okay let's go to surbi yeah. surbi again you're in a space that uh, in some way has been less impacted negatively rather it's been impacted positively tell us about where do you see the economy headed and when do you uh, in some way see demand coming back in other sectors yeah so um, you know for our sector which is mother and baby products uh, covid has been a silver lining we've been able to double our business i think overall e-commerce as a whole has uh, seen a huge opportunity and is now a growth engine uh, a lot of uh, large retail players are 
um, the real estate costs which come with the high street shops and malls is no longer feasible and have started pivoting online uh, which has led to a, and even from customers point of view uh, even though some retail segments have opened up the footfalls are very very low because customers are very uh, you know hesitant about going back into the shopping mode so they have moved online and even the later doctors who are not comfortable with digi digital payments have now started buying online so having said that i think it's the era of the e-commerce uh, and a lot of uh, brands will benefit by uh, moving to e-commerce and the flip side of it however is that even though the demand has surged the supply side remains constricted uh, a lot of our manufacturing uh, vendors are still uh, you know struggling to get back on track they are still working on 50% capacity so a lot of this economic stimulus that the government has announced needs to go to the manufacturing sector which forms the backbone of the economy so that the rise in demand that we are seeing from the consumer side can actually be met by the uh, shortfall in supply that has seen during the lockdown because even though e-commerce continued to operate manufacturing units were actually shut you think the supply chain was disrupted yeah. and the supply chains coming back in full way will lead to demand it's essentially what you say so shant you look at a lot of data you heard your co panelists tell us something that we don't know about what's happening to indian economy i mean give us some data point give us some um, insights that we don't know about tell us our viewers something uh, that they don't know um i can only probably uh, tell you something based on just what we've experienced in the last uh, few months yeah. um so while initially you know uh, in, uh, post march everyone was expecting a downturn uh, both in the global markets as well as domestic markets we've actually seen an upturn in some sectors uh, and the sectors are tech Uh, which, as you know, all the all the fang stocks are going through the roof. Um, and there is pharma, which is also booming, and the financial services sector is also doing reasonably well. It's holding firm. Um, so I, I think taking the cue from that, these are the three sectors in India, which I would say uh, can, if there is sustained investment in these and supply chain investment as well, then these are the three sectors which could which could drive growth going forward. uh um, because us personally at sg analytics we've actually grown 20% over the last uh, four months uh, driven by demand from these sectors globally uh so these in my view this is where the action will be of course long term everyone knows that you know infrastructure agriculture and manufacturing need to be invested into and they would be drivers of growth in terms of multiplier effect and i just want to ask you a straight question sushant when we are in october a month before diwali where yeah. the demand will be will it be at february levels so will it be back at 100% or will it be 70 80 will it be 120 where if you had to predict what would you say i would say that um, we are looking at a, a slow revival um, so um, if we are if, and it all depends actually on uh, how uh, you know where the vax where we are with respect to the vaccine um so if there is no vaccine and uh, for considerable time up to next year then we are looking at a slow revival uh if there is a vaccine then i think we could look at a very sharp revival uh both in the market sentiment because markets are usually demand is also very much driven by sentiment um so everything is at the bottom in terms of sentiment right You're now there is a variable in terms of the you know the cure for covid the vaccine if that goes away the new uh, but that's a big variable we we there lots of theories on that uh, udai just before we take the break we have let's go to mr Ma jawar mr jawar uh, again you are in the research space yeah. analytics space yeah. uh, and you work with yeah. uh, technology companies tele telcos tell right. us uh, something that we don't know sure i think uh, you know uh, so we're in the telecom sector and telecoms as an industry has been uh an industry that has actually you know skyrocketed in these times uh so uh, i think anything to do with you know work from home learn from home healthcare at home right i mean uh, uh my co panelists have talked about different industries kind of booming up i think everything kind of boils down to any industry any business that is directly or indirectly linked to work from home learn from home and healthcare at home is is you know kind of booming at the moment uh 
uh, telcos uh, in different parts of the world have seen a huge upside when it comes to data, uh, you know, when it comes to digital. So telecoms as an industry has actually been, uh, you know, one of the one of the few ones uh, that's actually, you know, kind of skyrocketed in these times. We are, of course, going to go straight back across to Himanshu uh, at this point. I think, Dr. Batra, you had a you had a larger question for him. Manshu, what I was asking is, there's some trends that we can see happening. Uh, right. But tell us something that we are not being able to see uh, in terms of trends in the economy, where it is headed, and if other markets are a good way to understand what will happen when the fear factor goes away. Uh, right. Give us an insight into that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, anything to do with work from home, learn from home, healthcare at home is, uh, is huge at the moment. Uh, looking at some of the other aspects, you know, so I think a lot of the other co-panelists talked about some are doing consumer business, some are into, you know, uh, some of the other sectors. Uh, and, and we talked about Diwali as well, right? I mean, you know, will demand kind of pick up then? I, I, I do have a feeling, you know, Diwali is big for Indians, right? And I, I do remember that 15th of April, at the time when China opened up lockdown, uh, the luxury brand Hermes, right, which does those Birkin bags or whatever, right? Hermes did in eight hours in one day when they opened up the store, they did $3 million of sale in eight hours, right? So from whatever, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. that they opened up the store, they did 20 crores worth of sale in eight hours. I think, you know, and as I think Varun mentioned as well, right? I mean, when things open up, uh, you know, people start ordering. So uh, I think uh, it, it's, it's going to be huge because Diwali is huge for Indians. So I think it's going to be huge. Uh, demand for certain products would sooner or later uh, kind of return back uh, as we head into uh, the next quarter. Okay. Prashant, you know, you, you mentioned, of course, uh, it all depends on the vaccine, but does it depend on when the peak also comes? Uh, you know, in India, because we still don't know. There's, there's of course, the re these revised estimates which have been going out, um, you know, from the ICMR side and, of course, uh, health health practitioner side. We've also, of course, been hearing that different parts of the country will have different peaks. You know, it's not going to be a pan-India peak at one point. So will this 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 comeback, you know, pre-COVID time, demand level surge, will all of that depend on when the peak comes as well? Absolutely, and, and in where the peak comes when. And when's uh, your estimate? When's your estimate? Since you're a numbers man, when's your estimate? So there are there are a lot of numbers going on, but uh, one number, two numbers I was particularly fascinated about is this antigen testing results in Delhi and Bombay, which reveal that they're close to 23 to 24 percent of people already being affected. And you notice that both these cities are now post peak, uh, so the number of cases in both these cities are coming down. So I'm interested to see the results of such a survey in other cities. And as I'm based in Pune, you know, Pune is peaking right now, big time. Oh, yeah. uh, so I would like to see if such a survey done in Pune, what are the results there? Um, because it seems that there's some correlation between the number of people who have been found positive with antigen uh, and the peak. Uh, so I can only say based on what I've seen so far, but it would be interesting to watch. Okay. Uh, so we have if you had to, in some way, uh, look at uh, what you've done to kind of pivot, I know you talk about being direct to consumer, digital to consumer, uh, you talk the homey channel, but do you see uh, retail store mattering less going forward or they, people will still come to retail stores for experience? I think retail stores will get, take a long time to come back. Because there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, there are new uh, societal norms, new hygiene practices. So only a X number of people are allowed in a store at a certain time. So that will mean longer queues. That will mean new social distancing norms. People used to go to the store for a whole new trial experience that, you know, they could try and buy. But that's no longer going to happen in the uh, new way. And with e-commerce uh, promising quick deliveries and having the returns in exchange, I feel that retail stores will have to pivot online rather than, you know, uh, the online players uh, having to pivot to a large extent. Okay. Uh, Varun, same question to you. You have to unmute yourself, Varun. I think this is the most commonly used statement right now. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I have a very different point of view on the retail uh, environment. And uh, I think while e-commerce has clearly shown boom, and 
Uh, this is the time where clearly Kiranas have been the biggest heroes and when it comes to fulfilling essentials for people. And uh, there was a time almost 12 months back when e-commerce was booming, modern trade was growing and a lot of people were calling out death knell for Kirana, saying, hey, it's, it's time to shut down the mom and pops. Right? And this is clearly the time when it has been established right that kiranas have come back come back as heroes and and are going to stay and and one of the things which has happened is um, they have come back at a time when you really needed them right uh, and these are stores where personal relationships matter you know this guy and right? he knows you right? and the fact that um, he or she was there when you needed them and is going to go a long way. People are not going to forget that. And um, people are going to remember that uh, this was the store which was open when their kid needed milk and, and they had to step out and get it. And, and, and that is going to have a major impact and, on ensuring uh, that Kirana growth continues to happen. And uh, where I think a lot of rethinking and as well as a lot of remodeling of how um, uh, the, the business model was being run will need to happen is the modern trade channel and where people were clearly setting stepping out for experiences and not just shopping and uh, now the fact that there is social distancing and you wouldn't want to sort of be in a place where there are you know thousand uh, people in there and I think that's the model where there will need to be some rethinking and tweaking and but this has been clearly the time when Kirana has come back big time. I, I, I think I agree with Varun and just to add you know, so with the whole uh, geo uh, uh, WhatsApp and Facebook uh, investment and partnership recently, the mom and pop shop is actually now become becoming your e-commerce store, right? Which is you kind of open up your WhatsApp and you can now order. So it's a very similar model to what happened in Southeast Asia via WeChat, where I could basically, you know, order my eggs and milk and bread and butter over WhatsApp and kind of pay over WhatsApp payment as well, right? So uh, definitely, uh, you know, and there are other shops players. are the heroes. And there are other players also. Yeah, Varun, uh, collaboration between uh, Kiranas and, of course, e-commerce portals and also these digital payment portals, is that the future collaboration? This, this, this model that we've seen in the last three months, as you said, has shown us that, that neither is outdated. You know, both will coexist, and, and especially in a country like India, which often merges India with Bharat. Yeah, so I think from a collaboration perspective, uh, the jury is still out there. I mean, uh, it I, I, it'll probably take a decade for us to reach a level where we can say, yeah, now that's a that's a large enough business. If you understand. Um, there are more than 10 million Kirana stores in India right? and uh, servicing this entire population of India. Right? Um, only if something really happens at that, you know, at least 20% of that scale, which means that 2 million plus Kirana stores are connected uh, with people is when it will become a really large business to make an impact. Um, it will take some time for us to reach there. And, and globally, um, even even in the other markets, it's it's still in nascent stages is what I would say. And the penetration that the largest uh, uh, e-commerce in Kirana with WeChat that have been able to achieve is still less than 2%. And so while it does look like uh, that that will be future and technology will merge well with these uh, uh, highly penetrated Kirana stores, but I think the time is still a little, uh, you know, further away. And uh, right now, uh, the phone call to to this person and and getting contactless delivery from your local banya and uh, is is still happening far more. And and people also, especially the the folks who have. Uh, uh, started stepping out at least to the stores from you'll you'll find that there is there is uh, uh, attraction which which they are driving frequency of visits has reduced and uh, but uh, it's still physical retail which which is which is flying there okay uh, aparupa uh, you worked in a bank before this do you think we don't need bank branches anymore fintech companies are the new banks uh, so to say and going forward uh, Possibly the asset light model in every sector will become the way uh, forward. Uh, when it comes to retail banking, I think uh, we are definitely moving towards a situation where going to branches will be lesser and lesser. Uh, because your RMs, your phone banking and everything today and your apps on the mobile is doing everything that you need. I mean, you don't really have to go in the branches to withdraw money and, you know, you just have your small ATMs. 
that print the cash and everything else you just do it on your app or mobile and uh, your phone banking so uh, as a future i think branches are going to reduce where banking is concerned and they are mostly going to be serviced by um, the back offices and the digital rms and your bots uh, of course uh, family and wealth is a different matter but for the common man the retail i think is going to change in terms of banking uh, pretty hugely you know because uh, banks are also realizing the real estate cost for bank branches and the efficiency of uh, without interface kind of a you know model so they will i think uh, going towards the future they will really, really look at uh, you know optimizing that Okay, you know, quite interesting, Dr. Vajra. Before I come back to you, you know, uh, Aparupa, since you asked her, of course, about her specific example, it's quite interesting that you you founded your business during these troubled times. Uh, what was your inspiration behind doing that? Um, did you believe that it was a huge risk as a, as well that you were taking? Um, you know, where did you get the confidence from? Where did you get the backing from? And how did that pan out? So, uh, always wanted to get into something that adds value to somebody's life, and I have been a coffee uh, addict uh, all my life, and I've never found good coffee here. You know, to be honest, that was my personal journey. And uh, from banking towards passion, that's a huge leap. Any entrepreneurship, I think, is a huge leap of faith and risk and hope, uh, which is what I took uh, along with a partner of mine. So. Um, we started this journey in january just to explore how to get really good quality coffee to the consumers uh, coffee that is chemical free which is organic which is of really good flavor and also fresh coffee you know because indians we are tuned to brewing our chai but not coffee we go for the instant fix when it comes to coffee we just buy it off the shelf uh so it was uh it was a brave journey i think it is a brave journey uh but it's been a very heartwarming and welcoming journey because like i said in the last couple of months the uh, you know the sales have surged people have started understanding what fresh coffee is all about brewing it so it it really gives a very positive uh, outlook towards the kind of niche business that i'm in so yeah okay dr batra yes you wanted to come in earlier Hey, one thing I want to ask all the entrepreneurs uh, is going forward. What are the things that you've learned in these four year months that possibly will hold you in good stead throughout your life, throughout your career as an entrepreneur? Uh, we can start with anyone. We can start with you, Sushant. Uh, I think uh, the most important learning for me uh, as a human being has been that uh, you got to take care of the people around you. Uh, you got to take care of the society around you, and that is the most important aspect of being a leader. And all entrepreneurs are leaders. Um, and if you do that well, and it has to come from within you, not with a motive, but it has to come from within you. That care and belonging with your people. Uh, so this crisis has taught me that uh, a lot, and um, that's truly really the learning for the future for me. Okay, Vibha, Vibha, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh... i would say agility uh, you need to be nimble uh, nimble uh, in what you think how you think and execute as fast as possible another thing that i would say maybe uh, applies to a lot of us in the startup community as well is good control over costs so uh, to thrive this uh, pandemic to thrive these scenarios it's very important to have good command over your pnl and uh, and as we see i mean if we talk about amazon amazon has seen so many such downturns and that's why it has become a leader and the other competitors have died out in their lows so that's that's something that uh, we felt that it is an important part of our journey and uh, we are taking it in good strides ruby yeah i would like to say two things one is resilience because these were uh, you know uncharted territory for all the entrepreneurs so you know how do you like we did not shut down our business for even a single day even though we could not ship and that was coming from customer centricity we wanted our customers to feel comfortable that yes as soon as things improve and the uh, lockdown opens up and e-commerce shipping is allowed we will continue to ship so customer centricity uh, you know focusing on them talking to them regularly helped us a long way in understanding what they need and we pivoted along with the customer feedback that we continued to get Okay, uh, Varun. 
I think uh, number one thing that uh, I'm going to take away is is uh, flexibility. So having plan A, but also having plan B, plan C, plan D. Or not having a plan, but <laughs> you know maybe the plan yeah. don't work. You got to you got to take it as it comes. In fact, I, 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 a very successful entrepreneur, and he said to me that best are the people who haven't planned very long. They're only planning a week at a time. So, but I get your point. Yeah, you got to so, keep an open <laughs> mind and. you know not stick to a suggested plan that you may have had. yeah so uh, i i think not just that but uh, um uh, having thinking about that if plan a does not work right if there is uh, x failure y failure z failure what can go wrong and asking that question and uh, because we Uh, a lot of times, what the questions that we ask is, "Hey, what went right?" and let's do more of that. And uh, and we forget about, you know, asking the question, "Okay, what can go wrong?" and um, on on what all parameters, right? And let's start preparing for it. If this goes wrong, what will I do? If this goes wrong, what will I do? And so I think having those plans, the B, C, Ds, um, is clearly something that uh, uh, you know uh, this this pandemic has taught us. And and we've been. effectively like you rightly said every week we have been having that uh, monday morning conversation and talking about hey what is going every to go wrong this week saturday <laughs> sunday look like monday <laughs> <laughs> so i don't think there is a differentiation on that himanshu uh, yeah can you learn that other people? so i think uh, the pandemic is uh, i think for all of us uh, is, is is a great not just for us but um, all of us is a great opportunity right i mean a uh, great opportunity to think what you've done in the past with a we how do we improve uh, so for us at loyds we've been able to uh, it took us about you know a couple of days couple of weeks it was chaotic that was end of march kind of uh, you know go work from home for all of us for a small company but uh, you know uh, uh, for all 100 150 of us to go work from home instantly we were never that transformed we never worked from home uh, previously but uh eventually it happened i think we've learned a lot in terms of a lot of first times have happened right we hired people digitally for the first time so for us touchwood uh, there was you know we we had our hiring on we hired people digitally without meeting them uh you know so uh, we we've done trainings for them digitally we haven't met the person in real the person has not seen our office you know we literally made a small hr deck which actually showed what the office looks like and what the culture and what the environment is right so i think it was a it took me back to when i was 18 years old and you know the first office and every everything we did as an entrepreneur you know 12 or 15 years back it was sort of again you know uh, reinventing the wheel again to say how do we live how do we survive in the digital world so a lot of first times happened again in the last 3 months and uh, you know it's it's been a it's been a great journey it taught, taught us a lot Okay, and Aparupa, what is your? Um, uh, I know you're very new into being an entrepreneur. Yes. Okay. So, at the crazy yogi, I think adaptability, because you know, from going to start a cafe to getting on to a complete digital platform, you know, to reinvent the whole cycle of how you see your customers, how you, uh, you know, gratify your customers, uh, that was a complete change. Uh, so, but necessity is, I think, the mother of innovation. <laughs> so that is how uh, we looked at it so adaptability i think is one of the key things that we have taken from this entire pandemic situation and uh, the I, the fact that we have to keep on innovating and to know that the customer today knows what they want and knows quality stuff and will go for it and you have to just uh, get the fulfillment right and be out there and like so we also said be resilient and be at it you know not to not to shift focus okay so reimagine your business reinvent your business absolutely and today would like to ask you a last question yes. if, if we had to look at the next 90 days would you predict a better economy worse economy or would it be tepid like how it is now of course there is a variable of when the yeah. vaccine will be uh, what the peak will be those are variable so what's your sense uh, in terms of economy in the next 90 days so we first we start with you good yeah. bad worse i think it will be definitely better and why uh, do you think so should be uh that's because the uh, you know people have come to accustom to themselves to the new normal 
they have got used to the social distancing norms they know that this is not something which is going away easily so now they've adapted to your new system. okay i'm afraid i'm going to have to quickly come in there and it's going to have to be a, a rapid fire now because we're running out of time okay. um so let's quickly get in the others himanshu uh, good bad better worse 90 days from now how's the economy going to be uh, uh you know if i look at uh, last 3 months uh, it'll be better but i think we're headed from a u shape curve to an l shape okay and right Aparupa. it'll take couple of years Oh. I think it will be slow, but we'll get there. I think we will move up the curve and um, get over it and get better. But I, I it will, will right be a slow curve. growth. Yes. I hope the right curve and not the wrong curve. <laughs> yes. right. I think it will be better for sure. Uh, I think uh, we we are learning to live with the disease now. Okay. All right, uh, Varun. I'm rooting for good. I'm surely rooting for good, and I'm I'm very confident it will be good. 90 days you're rooting for good. good yes, answer. absolutely. Whatever you have the last word. Uh, I would again go for good. I think the sentiment would improve uh, as we move. We have seen the worst so far. Yeah. Okay. So that's a good optimistic note to end on. I think. Who they sometimes ask me what's my view? I'll give. I think in the next 90 days uh, we'll be worse off, uh, but post Diwali we'll start seeing a revival, and hopefully by May, March, April we may be back to 50 percent of the levels. Okay, well, appreciate all of you joining us. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon.